Welcome back to Bad Things in History, where we take history seriously so you don't have to. Our series examining the worst events in each state continues. This time we turn our attention to Missouri. It is known as the Show Me State, and for more than 100 years it has shown the world that it is a top contender in the sport of human misery and suffering. Our first story is about when the state decided it needed to kill Mormons. Hans Mill Massacre Mormonism originally started in New York. It was founded by Joseph Smith, who remained the leader of the faith until his death in 1844. Smith and his followers had a problem, though. Wherever they lived, eventually their neighbors wanted them dead. In 1831, followers of the Mormon faith began moving to Missouri, but they didn't stay there long before problems started. On October 24, 1838, Mormons entered into a battle with the Missouri State Militia. This became known as the Battle of Crooked River. The Mormon forces were able to rush the militia position and force a retreat, but the result was that the Mormons were now at war with the state of Missouri. On October 27th, Governor Lilbum Boggs issued Executive Order 44, which stated that Mormons had to leave the state of Missouri or face death. Just three days later, the state militia would have its revenge. Hahn's Mill was established in Fairview Township, Missouri in 1835 by Jacob Hahn. Jacob was not a Mormon, however, over the next several years, Mormon families poured into the area and settled nearby. The events of the Battle of Crooked River caused great concern among the Mormon residents near Hahn's Mill. They noticed that the state militia was increasing in size and becoming more hostile. The Mormon men decided to organize themselves into a defensive force, just in case. They gathered inside a nearby blacksmith shop, which the group hoped would provide some defense. The women and children were sent away to hide in nearby trees. On the afternoon of October 30th, the Missouri State Militia rode into the community and right up to the blacksmith shop. Then, for the next hour, they unloaded their rifles on the Mormon defenders. Over 1,600 shots were released into the building. One of the Mormon town officials was wounded while escaping and surrendered to the militia. They shot him, then hacked his body to pieces. Once the battle was finished, militia members entered the blacksmith shop and found three children between the ages of 7 and 10. All three of them were killed. In addition to the children, 17 Mormons died during the battle. The militia occupied the town for the next several weeks and continued harassing Mormons in the area. Eventually, the remaining Mormons in Missouri relocated to Illinois, then finally to Utah. Jacob Hahn survived the attack on his mill and eventually moved to Oregon. General Order Number 11 The Civil War was a violent and confusing time in Missouri history. Although the state of Missouri did allow slavery, it did not secede from the Union during the war. But it wasn't immune to the violence. The rural population of the counties that bordered Kansas supported the Confederacy. They also helped supply the guerrilla army of William Quantrill. Part of the reason why is because Union militant groups known as Jayhawkers frequently crossed into Missouri and terrorized civilians. Union General Thomas Ewing Jr. decided one way to stop these Confederate raiders was to capture their wives, mothers, and other female relatives, so he captured ten women related to William Quantrill and other members of the guerrilla group. They were held in a building in Kansas City. On August 13, 1863, the building collapsed, killing most of the women inside. Quantrill's raiders attacked the city of Lawrence in retaliation. The defenders were at a serious disadvantage. Most of the town was already unarmed due to previous invasions by Confederates. That fact didn't stop Quantrill's gang from killing 150 people, most of which were young boys. This event became known as the Lawrence Massacre. General Thomas Ewing Jr. concluded that the best way to solve this problem was to make sure that William Quantrill stopped getting help from Missouri. He also didn't want to deal with retaliatory Union attacks coming from Kansas as Jayhawkers were threatening to invade Missouri in response to the Lawrence Massacre. So on August 25, 1863, he issued General Order No. 11. It said that everybody in the four Missouri counties bordering Kansas needed to leave their farms. If they could prove their allegiance to the Union, 
then the evicted citizens could stay in the area near a military outpost. Otherwise, they had to abandon their property and leave the county. The forcible relocation program had unintended consequences. The Union forces responsible for evicting citizens made it a point to also burn down their homes. Predictably, the strategy did not stop Confederates from receiving support. The remaining population of rural Missouri was more than happy to keep providing support for the Confederate Army. The artist George Calum Bingham was a sworn enemy of General Ewing and opposed the expulsion of Missouri farmers. He provided a description of the suffering it caused. It is well known that men were shot down in the very act of obeying the order and their wagons and effects seized by their murderers. Large trains of wagons extending over the prairies for miles in length and moving Kansasward were freighted with every description of household furniture and wearing apparel belonging to the exiled inhabitants. Dense columns of smoke arising in every direction marked the conflagrations of dwellings, many of the evidences of which are yet to be seen in the remains of seared and blackened chimneys standing as melancholy monuments of a ruthless military despotism which spared neither age, sex, character, nor condition. There was neither aid nor protection afforded to the banished inhabitants by the heartless authority which expelled them from their rightful possessions. In January 1864, General Ewing was replaced by General Egbert Brown. He repealed General Order 11 and allowed civilians to return to their homes. The Dioxin Disaster Industrial waste has destroyed more than one community in the United States. Usually, the destruction of a community happens over time due to the decisions of large companies, but in one strange case in Missouri, a single individual helped destroy an entire town. The town of Times Beach was founded in 1925 as part of a newspaper promotional effort. Anyone who paid for a six-month subscription to the St. Louis Times received a tract of land in the new community. Within a few short years, the new town contained several summer homes. As the Great Depression arrived, many of the families had to move into their summer homes full-time. Times Beach transitioned from a wealthy resort town into an area that was firmly middle class. Around 1966, the Northeastern Pharmaceutical and Chemical Company built a manufacturing facility near Verona. It produced the herbicide Agent Orange, which was used to destroy vegetation during the Vietnam War. The facility also made antibacterial agents that were used in items like soap and toothpaste. One of the byproducts of creating these chemicals were dioxins. These hazardous compounds had to be handled carefully. For the first several years, the chemical company sent its barrels of dioxins to Louisiana. The disposal process included completely incinerating the dioxins. However, this disposal method was also very expensive. Russell Martin Bliss was a small business owner. He had a local oil disposal facility. Additionally, he owned a horse arena and a farm, and he was happy to offer his own dioxin disposal services. Russell collected over 18,000 gallons of dioxin from the chemical plant. He then mixed it into containers that had waste oil. Soon after creating this chemical stew, Russell learned that wherever he sprayed the mixture, dust stopped being a problem. For the residents of Times Beach, dusty soil was always an issue. Neighbors noticed that Russell Bliss never had dust flying around his farm or horse arena, so they started paying him to spray their homes in nearby streets. On May 26, 1971, the owners of a stable in Moscow Mills paid Russell to spray their indoor arena. Within a few days of applying the solution, birds began falling dead from rafters in the ceiling. The horses started developing sores and losing their hair. A month later, he sprayed another stable near Jefferson City. This time, 12 horses died and several children were diagnosed with a skin condition caused by dioxin poisoning. The chemical company went out of business in 1972, but it left behind at least 90 barrels of waste chemicals buried on a nearby farm, and within a few short months, Russell Bliss had sprayed thousands of gallons of industrial waste all over the town. In 1979, the Environmental Protection Agency began investigating after a previous employee from the chemical plant told them about the buried barrels. They visited the sites where waste was buried, as well as the places where 
Russell sprayed his mixtures. All the sites were contaminated. The government began cleanup efforts, but nature would interfere with their plans. On December 4th, 1982, the Merrimack River flooded the town. Residents had to evacuate. When the waters receded, the EPA tested the soils and discovered that the floodwaters had spread dioxins throughout the entire town. The government decided that it was no longer safe for people to live there. The federal government began the process of buying residents' homes in 1983. By 1985, there was no longer anyone living in the town of Times Beach. If you want to learn more about environmental disasters, you may also enjoy a previous episode we made about the Love Canal disaster in New York. Kirkwood City Council Shooting Sometimes local politics can turn deadly. Charles Lee Thornton was born on December 23, 1955, near Meacham Park. It was an unincorporated area outside of Kirkwood. The community was also mostly African American. In 1992, residents in Meacham Park voted on a ballot initiative. It asked if they would like to be annexed into the city of Kirkwood. The residents voted to adopt the measure. Charles Thornton was in favor of this new development. He owned a construction company and assumed that as Kirkwood began building in his area, he would get the contracts. Although Charles did receive some work, most of the construction jobs went to other companies. In 1996, Charles began receiving citations from the city of Kirkwood. The greatest violation was that he didn't have a business license and kept operating a construction company out of his home. In response, Charles would appear at city council meetings and insist that he was a victim of racism. For several years, the city kept writing citations and Charles kept refusing to pay them, but he would show up to council meetings and loudly yell at city representatives, and in some cases, he did more than that. On May 13, 2002, he was convicted of assaulting the public works director, Ken Yost. In 2006, he was arrested twice at city council meetings, and in 2007, he was again convicted of assault when he began stomping on the owner of a restaurant. As his legal troubles continued to escalate, Charles tried to fix his problems by suing the city of Kirkwood. But on January 28, 2008, a judge dismissed the case. At this point, Charles Thornton was now bankrupt and possibly faced prison time. On February 7, 2008, he decided to kill the people who were ruining his life. Around 7 p.m. that evening, Charles parked his van on a side street near City Hall. As he exited the vehicle, he saw Police Sergeant William Biggs in a nearby parking lot. Charles walked up to him and shot him with a revolver, killing the police officer instantly. Then he took the sergeant's gun. Next, he entered City Hall right as the City Council meeting started. He fatally shot four people, including the Public Works Director Ken Yost. Then he shot Mayor Mike Swoboda twice in the head. Kirkwood police arrived and Charles began shooting at them. They returned fire, killing him. The mayor survived his injuries, however, at the time of the shooting, he had also been battling cancer. The mayor lost his fight with the disease on September 6th. In total, Charles Thornton killed five people and wounded two. The Joplin Tornado in addition to random violence, Missouri has also been the location of the most costly tornado in human history. On May 21, 2011, an area of low pressure formed over South Dakota. Very large thunderstorms were created over the state. The next day, a cold front moved through the area, which allowed the storms to grow even stronger. Then they began to move into Missouri. At 5.34 p.m. on May 22nd, a large tornado touched down on the state line of Missouri and Kansas. It started moving east and began increasing in intensity. As it moved into the city of Joplin, the tornado demolished homes and effortlessly tossed vehicles into the air. As the giant twister reached Main Street, the winds were in excess of 200 miles per hour. It destroyed Joplin High School and the nearby hospital was badly damaged and homes all along the path of the storm were simply blown away never to be seen again. The next day, authorities began examining the damage. They concluded that at its worst, the tornado reached wind speeds of 250 miles per hour. 
The result was that 25% of Joplin was destroyed and the remaining 75% was seriously damaged. It also killed 158 people and injured another 1,100. Insurance companies had to pay out over $2.8 billion to residents of the town. This is still the highest insurance payout in Missouri history. Massacres, discrimination, pollution, murder, and natural disasters are just a small sample of the horrible events that have visited the residents of Missouri. What do you think about these stories from the state's troubling past? Did we miss anything important? Tell us about it in the comments below. Does it comfort you to know that we're making content like this every week? If so, then consider offering us something in return. We accept PayPal donations, have a Patreon, and even a few products on our website's merchandise store. Links are in the description if you're interested. Thank you for watching Bad Things in History.